Yesterday's prophecies, today's headlines. This is the Hal Lindsey Report. And now, Hal Lindsey. Good evening and welcome to this edition of the Hal Lindsey Report. Iran, China, North Korea, and Russia are currently being sanctioned by the United States. In each case, the sanctions are hitting harder than anyone anticipated. All four represent legitimate threats to the world peace and human rights. Three of the four are nuclear powers. The fourth, Iran, is working hard to get nuclear weapons. The Trump administration is determined to keep that from happening. The sanctions are intended to get Iran back to the negotiating table. However, former Secretary of State John Kerry seems to be actively working against U.S. interests. In his visit to Iran since he left office, he has advised the Iranians to simply wait out Donald Trump. When asked about it, he answered as if it were no big deal. He said, I think everybody in the world is talking about waiting out President Trump. In other words, yes, he is undermining the U.S. government's attempt to get Iran to the negotiating table. He is damaging our efforts for peace. But Iran is a terrorist state with a suicide bomber's mentality. Iran's brand of Shia Islam teaches that the Muslim Messiah, the Mahdi, will come into the world at a time of major chaos. And the Iranians have shown themselves more than willing to create that chaos. If any nation on earth should be prevented from acquiring nuclear weapons, it is Iran. A few weeks ago, Reuters reported that Iran is now sending ballistic missiles to its allies inside Iraq. Nikki Haley is the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. Last week, she said in recent months, Iran's aggression has escalated. Iranian proxies in Iraq operate openly with funding, training, and weapons supplied by Tehran. The Iranian regime has reportedly begun over the last few months to transfer ballistic missiles to these proxies in Iraq. It is reportedly developing the capability for its proxy militia to produce their own missiles inside of Iraq. I have been talking for some time about the massive flow of arms from Iran to Hezbollah in Lebanon. Israel has been fighting this. The IDF recently said that it has struck more than 200 targets in Syria over the last year and a half. All of them were related to stopping the flow of arms to Hezbollah. So far, they have slowed such movements, but they have not stopped it. Israel faces the possibility of a devastating war with Hezbollah. If that happens, it will be a proxy war with Iran. Last week, Hezbollah leader Hassan Mezrala said, the battle is already over. He said, all your attempts to prevent Hezbollah from possessing accurate missiles are foiled. We have accurate missiles that if used in any future war will change the entire equation. There's a lot of truth in what he's saying. Hezbollah already has a massive missile arsenal and Iran is building factories for them to make more. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu rarely answers Nasrallah's provocations, but this time he did. He said, if he confronts us, he will get a blow that he cannot even imagine. Since the last time they fought, Hezbollah has become far more powerful. 
but so has Israel. Last week, Jews around the world celebrated Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. It is the holiest day on the Jewish calendar. On that day, 45 years ago, the Arab world launched a sneak attack on the nation of Israel. On October 6, 1973, every Israeli soldier that could be spared was home on leave. Suddenly, the Egyptian and Syrian armies attacked. The Blitz caught Israel off guard on both fronts. In addition to Egypt and Syria, Israel faced forces from Jordan, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and Cuba, all supported by the Soviet Union. In 1973, Israel had 400,000 troops. They faced over a million. Israel had 1,700 tanks. They faced 3,600. Israel had 3,000 armored carriers. They faced 4,000. Israel had 948 artillery units. They faced 1,720. Only in combat aircraft were the numbers close. Israel had 440. They faced 452. So, in addition to the element of surprise, the enemy had overwhelming numbers in its favor. In the first days of the war, the Arabs won unprecedented and stunning victories. Israeli casualties were high. Hardened and confident combat units were so outnumbered and outflanked. They were fleeing in disarray. They lost 500 tanks and 49 aircraft in the first three days. At the time of the invasion, Israel controlled the Sinai Peninsula. They had a series of defensive installations along the eastern shore of the Suez Canal. It took Egypt only two hours to overrun those defenses. In the Golan, on the northern border of Israel, Syrian tanks rolled through the Israeli defenses. They moved to the edge of Galilee and Israel's heavily populated valleys. Only a handful of Israeli tanks stood in their way. Later, I interviewed a tank commander from the crack Golani Brigade. He told me that the fighting began suddenly. The whole Syrian border erupted with artillery fire. 1,400 top-line Soviet-built tanks charged forward. The Syrians had a new anti-tank missile that wreaked havoc with Israeli tanks. In response, the Israeli Air Force streaked in low attacking the Syrian border forces. The tank commander told me that he watched in horror as the Syrians knocked plane after plane out of the sky. The Soviets had designed a new surface-to-air missile for intercepting low-flying planes. Israel had no countermeasures for it, either in the Golan Heights or in the Sinai. By noon, the Golani tank forces had been cut to pieces. The officer I spoke to commanded the last three remaining tanks. He and his soldiers knew they were the only thing that stood between the Syrian army and Galilee. He positioned them at a critical crossroads ready for a fight to the death. When the Syrian commander could see only three tanks were blocking his way, he hesitated. He thought it must be a trap. He ordered his forces to stop while they analyzed the situation. During the lull, Israeli reinforcements arrived and pushed the Syrian forces back. By a miracle of God, the invaders went 
no farther in Israel, though the horrific fighting continued. The Israeli tank commander attributed their success to God's protective care over Israel. The Yom Kippur War was not like any of Israel's previous wars. This time, Arab armies scored major dramatic victories. Israeli casualties were the highest yet. But over the following days, Israel held on and was able to fully mobilize its forces. At a heavy cost in personnel and equipment, they began to repel the Arabs. At first, U.S. President Richard Nixon was hesitant to begin a full-scale resupply effort for Israel. But the Soviets didn't hesitate they almost immediately began a massive resupply effort for the Arabs. Finally, the United States began to funnel equipment from the Mediterranean into Israel. The tide fully turned. Soon, the IDF was advancing on Cairo and shelling suburbs of Damascus. A UN-brokered ceasefire saved Egypt and Syria from almost unimaginable defeat. As usual, the United Nations failed to act while the Arabs were doing well. But when things turned in Israel's favor, the UN quickly intervened. This story isn't just history. Today, Hezbollah seems anxious to test its new missiles. Iran and Israel are already directly fighting one another in Syria. You might think that Iran's raging domestic problems mean they won't attack Israel. But nothing solidifies a government's influence over its own people more than a war with a hated enemy. The situation in the Middle East has changed a great deal since 1973, but the basics remain the same. For those Israelis who lived through the Yom Kippur War, one word comes up again and again, miracle. Israel triumphed because God intervened. It wasn't the first time and it won't be the last. The Jewish people survived thousands of years after being dispersed among the nations, a miracle. They have been brought back to the land of promise, a miracle. Just as God said it would happen, they became a nation again in a single day, another miracle. In 1967, they retook Jerusalem, and that was a miracle. They have survived their own leader's ill-conceived attempts to make peace another miracle. These big miracles required millions of little miracles all along the way. Think about Harry Truman's improbable path to the U.S. presidency. But God put the right man in the right place at the right time for Israel. He was in office just when they needed him. When Israel declared its independence in 1948, President Truman recognized the new nation just 11 minutes later, thus immediately legitimizing it and giving it valuable international protection. And that's a miracle. When we look at this tiny nation today, we should never cease to be filled with wonder. In Hebrew, the word yom means day, and kippur means atonement, yom kippur, the day of atonement. It is a Sabbath of Sabbaths, a time of fasting, repentance, and forgiveness. In Leviticus chapter 23, 27, God said to Moses, on exactly the tenth day of this seventh month is the Day of Atonement. Leviticus chapter 16 says, It is on this day that atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you 
you shall be clean from all your sins before the Lord. The priest who is anointed and ordained to serve as priest in his father's place shall make atonement. The New Testament reveals that Jesus is our eternal high priest. The blood he sprinkled on the altar was not that of goats or calves. It was his own blood shed on the cross. Hebrews chapter 9 says, Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Think of it. The blood of Christ purchased our eternal redemption. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22 says, Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. When we knowingly sin, God wants us to draw near to him with a sincere heart. To be honest in full assurance of faith, that means faith in what Christ has done. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 10 says, By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. God loves us and accepts us. We're forgiven. He wants us to own up to what we've done and thank him for his forgiveness. How absolutely fantastic to know that forgiveness is guaranteed to us through the once and for all offering of Jesus Christ on our behalf. In the Amplified Bible, Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 says, Therefore he is able also to save to the uttermost, completely, perfectly, finally, and for all time and eternity. Those who come to God through him, since he is always living to make petition to God and intercede with him and intervene for them. Maybe guilt has tied you in knots for years. You've just been waiting for God to lower the boom on you for some secret sin. That very guilt has produced an estrangement from the one person you need to be closest to right now, your Heavenly Father. Imagine how wonderful it would be to have him fold his great strong arms of love around you. Let him reassure you of his love and acceptance. Let him do it now. He isn't angry with you. No matter how much you've let him down, if you have accepted Christ's forgiveness, then you can trust that forgiveness for any offense toward him. The only thing that grieves God now is for his children to feel alienated toward him when he cares for them so much. Let today be your Yom Kippur. Or maybe you have never accepted the forgiveness Jesus purchased for you on the cross. It is essential for you to do that. It's the most important thing you will ever do. Jesus is our high priest. He always lives to make intercession for us. Always includes today. That means you too can let this be your Yom Kippur, your day of atonement. The ministry of Jesus was unique. His miracles were like nothing the world had ever seen. Teaching people to love your enemies was totally novel. His whole approach to worshiping and serving God was different from anything they had been taught. The Judaism they knew was concerned mainly with outward behavior. It left the inner man the spring of action untouched. 
Jews knew that they committed what God calls sins, but they believed sin could be disciplined out of a man by studying the law, praying, and doing good. This was the area where they saw the most fundamental difference between the teaching of Jesus and that of the rabbis. Judaism started with a demand for outward righteousness and pointed to sonship as its goal. Jesus reversed that. He taught that righteousness would be the result of sonship. He said humanity's biggest problem was its sinful nature. He offered forgiveness as a gift. He said he would give men a new heart and a new father-son relationship with God, including all the privileges inherent in such a relationship. When he gave the Sermon on the Mount, he followed a pattern like this. He would say, You've heard it taught that the ancients were told and he would quote one of the external commandments handed down in their tradition. Then he would astound the people by saying, in effect, but I say to you, it isn't just sinful actions that will be judged by God, but the motives in a man's heart. The people could see that he didn't speak as the scribes and Pharisees. They were forever quoting other scholars in support of their teachings. But Jesus spoke as one having the authority of God within himself. He told the Jewish leaders, you search the scripture because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is these that bear witness of me and you are unwilling to come to me that you may have life. In that one sentence, Jesus put his finger on the problem with human beings of that day and of all time. We can't just search. The evidence points to Jesus. The scriptures tell us of him. In him is eternal life. But you have to believe in him. By that, I don't just mean a mental assent to an abstract idea. I mean a faith commitment to a real person, Jesus. The Bible gives us a broad outline of coming history. Its prophecies are often remarkably specific, but it doesn't tell us who will win next week's big game or what will happen between the United States and North Korea. The Bible gives us answers, but only in general terms. On the other hand, you have the answer to an even more urgent question. What's next for you? I don't mean that you know when you will die or even what will happen five minutes from now. I mean that now, at this moment, you're going to decide what you will do with Jesus, not tomorrow. You have no guarantees beyond this moment. You're being confronted right now with the most important question of life. What are you going to do with Jesus? Jesus is offering you a pardon for all your sins. It is a pardon that provides for your escape from eternal damnation and your entrance to eternal happiness with God himself. It is a pardon Jesus purchased by dying on the cross. I'm happy to tell you that it is so simple to receive that pardon. You can do it right now, right where you are. First, confess to God that you know you're a sinner and can never be good enough to enter heaven on your own. Then simply believe that Jesus is who he said he is, the Son of God. Now ask him to forgive you your sins and accept you as his child. Then accept his free gift of forgiveness and believe that he will do all that he has promised he do. Ask God to show you how to live for him and trust him to give you a new heart and new spirit. He will. If you said that and sincerely meant it, then you have just become 
part of God's forever family. Well, that's it for tonight, folks. God willing, I'll see you next week. You've been watching the Hal Lindsey Report. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit hallindsey.com or call 1-888-RAPTURE.